welcome to the Fat Tail Investment Podcast. We've got a very special edition coming up for you this week because I'm going to channel the spirit of a man who's no longer with us. And uh, the reason being, uh, it's to do with my favorite book. And I'm going to hold it up here. And it's called How to Get Rich. And it's by a guy called Felix Dennis. Now, he's one of my favorite characters. He was an English publisher. He's dead now. Uh, hence the title of the show, but he he wrote this book after successfully a very successful career where he started with nothing and ended up with hundreds of millions of dollars of pounds. Uh, so pounds, he was British, uh, so very very wealthy man, net worth you know, north of five hundred million. Uh, incredible story, and he decided to put down how to make money uh, in a book, but it is it is not to do with the share market. And the reason I bring it up, it's to do with building a business. And to to clarify that, why are we talking about that? Well, to invest in the stock market, you have to have some money in the first place. And one of the best ways to do that is to build a business. So you, you're generating lots of revenue or you can uh, cash out and uh, you know make an asset sale and take those profits and then uh, start investing. So it's just a slightly different way to approach building uh, wealth. And as I say, How to Get Rich, um, I don't love the title, but it's a fantastic book in my view. Now, let me, very early on in the piece, I know it looks quite thick, so you might be put off by that, but very early on in the piece, Felix says that money didn't make him happy, but it did improve his sex life a lot, sex life a lot rather. And I can tell you our video producer here, Swifty, once he got to that bit, he flew through the book um, to absorb all those lessons. So he talks about building a business, um, how to get capital, what to do with your staff, and all sorts of different things. Now, because he ran his own business, uh, I just thought it would be interesting to read a small bit to you about how he viewed the share market. Because at one point in time, Felix uh, floats with his partners, floats a business onto the stock exchange. And I just, th- I just thought uh, there's lots of great insight in this book, by the way, but this is a particular interest of me because it, 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 it clarifies the difference between running a private business in one way and the stock market, which has its own little rules. So this is Felix um, talking about the public company that, he's, uh, that he was involved with. So here he goes. A private company could never have operated in the way Peter, which was his business partner, was required to run micro warehouse. A private company lives on profits and reserves. There has to be a balance between investment and profit taking, between growth and the bottom line. In a private company, growth is not a goal in itself. You only grow if it makes sense to grow. But a public company exists only to boost its share price, and its share price is determined, incredibly enough, by analysts, spotty face youths who live on another planet where growth at any price is the only deity one is encouraged to worship. Medium or long-term strategies were for wimps and amateurs in their estimation. This quarter's results, this quarter's growth, were the only things that mattered to them. It almost seemed at times as if profit was a dirty word. If we were making profits, asked the analysts, weren't we in danger of wasting money that could have been invested to produce more growth? Huh? So that's Felix there talking about why the share market was very different to running a private company. And I bring it up because that's why in the share market, you often get stocks with crazy price to earnings ratios or have stocks that don't make money yet can soar in value um, if the market perceives a massive growth market is coming up. So the market will chase ahead of profits that are coming in the future or what it thinks is coming in the future, where a private business business, uh, has to rely on its cash flow because it has to pay its bills, et cetera. Whereas in the public markets, the Companies can, can keep going back to investors via capital raisings, et cetera. Anyway, there's lots of nuggets of wisdom in, in there from Felix. He was a bit of a wild character. He loved to drink. He loved to smoke. He took drugs. Um, he uh, was a, a womanizer and uh, never married. And unfortunately, that lifestyle all caught up with him in the end, and he died of throat cancer in his 60s, and that was about eight years ago. So for today's interview, I've taken a, uh, a friend of mine, Stuart, who also built up uh, a business, um, took it over, I think he was about in his 40s thereabouts, 
and built it up and and sold it. So I thought rather than talk to the ghost of Felix Dennis, which we can't do uh, as yet, um, we don't have the Wi-Fi for it, uh, we <laughs> get Stewie on and he's going to tell us how he went about building his business and some of the insights he's gleaned from advising other people on how to build their businesses too in the startup phase. So here's my friend Stuart Bracken to discuss building business wealth. I hope you enjoy it. Already earlier, I alluded to having my friend Stuart on, who's uh, an entrepreneur and a, a, a businessman, and now an investor. And I tasked him with reading the book of uh, Felix Dennis. So, Felix's uh, position was that the best way to build wealth was to have your own business, and that brings up a whole bunch of uh, questions and strategies about how to go about it. So, Stewie, you've read most of the book. You're aware of Felix Dennis now. First of all, the premise is, in your opinion, the best way to build wealth, having your own business? Well, the simple answer to that is probably yes. Um, but there's a few caveats on it, of course. It depends on the business, obviously. Uh, for the most part, I would say if you did it any other way, for argument's sake, if you were to sacrifice as you were going through your life, not enjoy your life, um, push all your funds away and invest them as you were going, you could still end up reasonably well off, but there would be significant sacrifices along the way to get to where you needed to go. So the answer is very simply yes, but I must put a caveat on it. It really does depend on the business. Some businesses only pay wages and some businesses pay wages a little bit more. Very successful businesses make a lot of money, obviously, and that's a very different um, response and a very different answer. I was fortunate enough to be in a business that wasn't a business that just paid salaries. Um, so I would say that um, my wealth is where it is today because of that business. So the answer, summarising it, is probably yes. So when when you have the idea, okay, you go, okay, I want to get into business. Um, obviously, as you say, there are some good businesses, there are bad businesses. Indeed. Is it harder to find a good business or to come up with an idea for a business or is the harder part not starting so much, but actually executing it and running into all those issues like managing staff, cash flow, finding customers, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? Well, life's really about preparation and opportunity, I believe. And I think it's important to prepare yourself. If you're going to go into business, you need to be prepared. A lot of people aren't. They think they are, but they're not. Um, and the second thing is you need the opportunity to come along and you need to be able to identify that it's an opportunity worth taking. I would say selecting the business is critically important because um, every one that you think about or look at, you should reject, you should be rejecting multiples. Um, now, that's a hard thing because what people do is they find something they like and they instantly think, I can make this work. Um, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. So I think you need to be very careful. Um, if I was giving examples, if you're a motor mechanic and you're in a small town and there's 100 people and you're the only motor mechanic, you would say to yourself, well, it might service my needs and I might be able to survive. Now, clearly, if there's three motor mechanics in the same town, before you decide to go off and do that, you need to stop and think. I think it's important to understand and do your due diligence before you start. There are plenty of businesses where they really will not make a lot of money. They will survive. And if making a living is what you're intending to do, then you should be aware of that and go for it. But not all businesses make copious amounts of money. As for what's harder, uh, look, probably running a business, depending again on the scale, running a large business in certain areas, there's probably no harder challenge in life. I was uh, in the design and construction industry and all of our work came on the back of winning contracts. So what would happen would be you would bid for a contract, you were successful, you would employ more people to fulfil the contract, which meant that you needed to then win more work to fulfil the obligation of keeping this machine going. And then it just sort of snowballed and kept going from there and there and there and on. And because it wasn't something where, you know, people need their car services, service, so that 100 cars that you have in town that you're servicing, it wasn't like that. So every single time you had to bid on the work and that gave a complexity and a degree of risk and um, stress that some businesses have and some businesses don't have. 
Some businesses have regular income. Some people have spiked income. And this is what this was like. And you have to manage your cash flow very carefully because you would be on a very successful tender, but then you might have one that wasn't particularly good. You didn't know where the next one was going to come from, so you had to be putting your money aside. I would say running them is harder than picking them. But after saying that, I think picking them is absolutely critical. You need to understand supply and demand. You need to understand the basics of running a business or at least understand the product that you're going to sell very well. There's a whole raft of things that you need to understand. I don't think the answer is clearly one or the other. It's probably both. But if you get a big business running, it is considerably more difficult than what most people, I suspect, believe. I know in the book, Felix makes a big deal about how he thinks the fear Fear of failure stops most people. So they just accept having a job, a wage, and they never really go for it, even if they think they might be tempted. Yes. Have you encountered that too during your working life with people around you and, and perhaps you even had to overcome something like that yourself before you started your business? Look, I think that comment on, in his book, I think, is uh, partly true and true in a lot of instances, but not entirely true and not in all instances. Um, and what I mean by that is, there's a raft of reasons why people don't always uh, go into business. I think more to the point, people can be content with their lot. And if you're content with your lot, that's slightly different to not having the intestinal fortitude to take on a business. If you're happy and you're happy within your life and you feel that you've got what you need financially and you've got a good work-life balance, then you're unlikely to go ahead and do it. If you're one of those people that needs challenged, you might do it. But again, I don't think it's simply a matter of being scared to do so. Um, otherwise, what you would have is everybody who, and I must, add, I must add to that too, that you could be the smartest person, the best in your field, but you might be risk averse. Everybody has a different risk profile. Some people can jump out of airplanes and think that's perfectly okay, and other people, the thought of it gives them a heart attack. So, you know, it really is, there's a whole raft of things. There's no single thing, and I think he's wrong in suggesting that's it for everybody because I actually think contentment is a bigger issue. If you're content, you tend not to take the chance. That's the bottom line. Well, he does say along the way, because remember, the premise of his book is how to get rich. So the business is a, sure. is, a is an avenue to get rich. So. Sure. He, he sort of says that you have to have an insane level of compulsion to sort of to take on this beast because if you want to go for it, you're going to have to give it everything. So Correct. what you're saying is not everybody's got that, and if you're happy with it, then that's that's good enough. Well, if you're happy with your lot in life, you tend not to do it. You, you, it's like anything. You take different risks at different times in your life. If you're older and you're closer to the finishing line and you've accrued a bit of money, your risk profile might be completely different to if you're feeding three kids and you're trying to pay a mortgage. <laughs> so, you know, everybody has different risk profiles. Some people just throw caution to the wind. Those same people quite often do very well in business but then lose it and then have another successful business and then lose it and then have another successful business. So somewhere in between the truth lies, you've got to be realistic about what your skills are. And the other thing I think, and we'll probably talk about this later, I would assume, by the tone of the conversation. But the other thing is that the biggest hurdle I think people have is their own mindset, as in are they emotionally able to take this on? Are they genuinely willing to commit everything to this task? And are they able to take it and hold it together emotionally to do it? A lot of people are emotional beings and they can't pull together that emotion long enough to be able to take with the stresses and strains, the staffing issues, all of the things that come with business, and it breaks them down. They're morally, or morally, they're emotionally unable to do it. And I think that people know what they are. Down deep, I think people know what they are and are not. So even though he says, look, you know, if you've got the skills and you give it a go, you, you, it's highly probable that you're going to make it. There's all sorts of other things that affect people. And I think the one I've just touched on is probably the biggest one. People's emotional state and ability and willingness to, to dedicate to the task is very, very rare in my experience. When you started your business and you went into it, did you find quickly that you had made some assumptions that were wrong or that you, it was more intense than you thought it was going to be? Or you were like, no, I'm prepared for this, and then you just ran with it as you encountered the challenges? The thing that probably caught me by surprise was the intensity. I don't, I don't think I was, a shy, I was ever shy of work, uh, but if... When I started, if I'd realised what was required of me through those periods, 
I may have said no. Now, it's probably a good idea I didn't know because you've got to understand to do some things properly, you've got to devote your life to it, every waking moment. And by the way, half your sleeping moments are taken up with it as well. And there's a whole raft of compromises that you have to be willing to make to do it, and, and particularly in the early stages to make the business where it needs to go. Now, again, I say it depends on business. Not every business is the same. There are, <coughs> pardon me, there are businesses which um, basically you go, it's almost like working for an employer except you're selling something and that something is enough to pay your wage and maybe a little bit extra. And you get regular clientele and the business goes along and you're fine. But in businesses that grow um, considerably in a very fast period of time, as in mine did and my business partners did, um, it was um, incredibly intense. And I think that I underestimated that. Now, it wasn't that way initially. Um, in the first half a dozen, five to half a dozen years, it wasn't quite so bad. But towards the end, as the machine got bigger and bigger, I literally had to devote every waking moment of my life and, as I say, half of my sleeping life. So a lot of people would not be able to do that. They wouldn't have the intestinal nor fortitude to do it. And the stress that goes with that is grossly undervalued. Some people either don't feel it and they're dangerous and some people feel it too much and they're also dangerous. So you need to sense the urgency of, of risk and you need to be able to, it needs to be forefront in your mind, but it can't break you. By the same token, you can't be oblivious to it. I've seen businesses fail where people were oblivious to it and I've seen people fail because they just literally broke. Emotionally, they couldn't put up with it for the prolonged periods of time, the lack of sleep, the working when you're unwell, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, staffing issues, um, personal family issues that come along. People come and die and, and whilst you're working and you don't have the time to grieve like you would if you were normally when your mind is concentrating on something 24-7. Now, I know I'm painting a fairly horrific picture because everyone who's listening to this will probably think, <laughs> oh, no, this is just, it's all going to be fun. You know, I'm going to drive a Ferrari and it's, but they need to understand that for the most part, it's not like that. I'm just thinking, when you're running your business, you started off early. How aware of, were you of the wider economic picture? Was that a concern for you or was it literally you were in your industry? Uh, I'm just thinking here because you would have ran your business through 2008, I imagine. Correct. And so I'm just wondering if that sort of blindsided you, like, oh, my God, where did this come from? Yeah, look, um, well, the first thing is I think when you talk about due diligence, when you first get – when you first start in a business, you really don't have the skills. Very few people have the skills. You might have the technical skills to perform the task that you're intending to do, but I don't think you really fully understand the business. It's very rare that people have a full understanding, and that's why um, the ability to adapt when you're in business is very important because you've got to learn those skills. You know, you just you don't you're not born with them. You gradually pick them up as you go. I was in a very fortunate situation where I had a very good friend of mine who was my business partner who had very good business skills and had very, very high-level accounting skills, probably the best I've ever seen. And he really nurtured the business through those initial stages and, to be honest, probably the whole way through its operation. I was more um, a little bloke in the corner who sat in the corner and probably uh, wore the elbows out of his shirts as he was putting programs together and whatever else. So it was a good match. I don't, well, I know I couldn't have done it without him and I hope and I think he would say the same to me. So some businesses you need help. Now, whether that's people you're going to partnership with or whether the people you employ throughout the business uh, or whether that's people you contract in, uh, but certainly you need, you need support. When, as you were building your business, did you have an end game in mind? Were you building it up with the idea to sell it or you just sort of got on this horse and it started running and you, and you just sort of ran with it until you're like... Yeah, look, the, probably the former, not the latter. Um, towards the end, we planned the end um, a few years out. Um, it's very important to do that for a whole raft of technical reasons. Um, and I won't bore everyone with the detail because each one of these questions you could talk for hours on preparation for selling businesses and so forth. But it really was a case of a good idea that ran away. And that's, I think, most businesses like that. I know people plan that the business is going to get huge. Um, a lot of them don't. And I don't know that planning really makes them huge. Um, I think you have to run at it, uh, bite off as much as you can chew and chew like hell. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it do doesn't. I don't, I don't think... 
planning that one day it was going to be what it was. I had no idea when it started it would end up what it was. How's that? And I had no idea that it would be sold uh, at one stage or another. I did when we were halfway through it or three-quarter way through it, but not before that. I'm just thinking of Felix's book here. He mentions along the way about certain startup errors. I don't know if you got to this bit. One was managing cash flow, that kind of thing. Yeah. When you've you've observed a couple of times about you know people not getting there, that type of thing, do you think that's operational mistakes that they've made or is it because they're, they're in an industry that's just not growing that much or it's just not a good business from the get-go? Both. Both. Um, some people fail because it's just not a business that was ever going to succeed. Um, and some people fail because they can't manage the business correctly. It's a combination of both. There's no one right answer or wrong answer there. Um, I've seen both models and both and people fail under both conditions. Um, so really there's no right or wrong answer to that one. It is, it is a bit of both, to be fair. So when you've, you've, you've read Felix, um, you mentioned there were some things you agreed on and some that you didn't. Was there one particular one or two things that he said that you that resonated with your experience? Um, I think uh, the effort bit resonates with me and the fact that he, with great detail and in a long-winded fashion, <laughs> explained, the, explained the, the fact, the complications and the effort required and the sacrifices. He did get that right. If the business gets out of control. It's very easy to get out of control because it's a, once you start pushing, it's like a. When you a, say out of control, you mean like you're super busy or the fact yes, that it's going down? Super, yeah. super busy. Yeah, look, you know, you've got to use the rally driving analogy, really. You've got to be 80% in control at least 60 or 70% of the time. You're never 100% in control, but you need to be in control as much as you can. I mean, it gets busier and busier and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so it needs more and more input, more and more sacrifice. He's 100% correct. It is um, you almost, at some stages throughout the process, you're almost hoping that it doesn't get any bigger than it does. But it's a, once it starts moving, it's really hard to control because it, then in a bigger project, like I remember initially we'd start and $100,000 was a big project. Um, in the end, I was quoting work at tens of millions. So, you know, it, and it, you don't realise it's happening. Because you do a hundred thousand, then you do a half a million, then you win a contract at two million, and the next thing you know, you're sitting down, uh, putting together tenders for things worth large sums of money, and it's the, t the to be honest, as ridiculous as this sounds, it just ends up with a number of zeros at the end. The process is exactly the same, but you end up in a position where you can't not because now you've got all these qualified people that you put a lot of training and effort into. You've got all of this money sitting invested in, in the business and you have to work it. It's frozen. That's better. You're unfrozen. Ah, there we go. You're back. Yep. Oh, that was my fault, I think. That's right. Um, all right. So we're talking about Felix, the pressure of the business getting bigger. Yep. I know you mentioned one time that now that you're semi-retired, you're looking to or you're willing to to help out other small businesses. And you said once that they often come to you and, and they think the solution to their problem is to rebrand. Yes. And you said, well, I don't know why they all say that or think that, but that's yeah. not the solution to the problem. What, no. when, when you see that, what's usually going wrong and what's the right solution other than rebranding? Look, I guess it's like anything. Um, there are times when you have to rebrand, but it's very, very infrequent. Um, normally there's a systemic problem that's causing it not to take off and rebranding doesn't help that systemic problem, whether it's a staffing issue, lack of collateral, the wrong product in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, sometimes you might rebrand if you want to start as fresh and you don't want to be associated with the other body or the other party or whatever the case may be. And I get all, I get that. It's certainly not the solution to your problem. If that, if you think rebranding, if you've got a problem and you think rebranding is going to fix it, give it away. You need to be doing something else because you're wrong. It's something else systemically wrong. And you have to track back what that something else is. Um, and it's definitely not the name of the company. In the um, in the book, Felix talks about how, you know, one of the hard parts when you when you um, I'm gonna say young guy, but just say uh, you're starting your business, you don't have much clients, so therefore cash flow, and maybe you don't have much money. And he's like, Well, this is the one of the hardest parts is like, where do you get the money from? You know, share markets, debt markets, that's good for big companies. Um 
in your experience dealing with smaller businesses, is access to finance a big hurdle that needs to be overcome? Huge, absolutely huge. We were fortunate in that we were in a um, high profit industry. It was quirky and unique and high profit. So we grew organically. We didn't need to seek funds. But nearly every business that I've seen since then, that's the single biggest hurdle. hurdle. Um, insufficient funds to get the thing going. That coupled with the fact that people generally today are not willing to wait. In other words, they're not willing to work, make some profit, reinvest the profit, grow again, wait, reinvest the profit, grow again. Most people want the problem solved or the thing bigger or quicker than what it is today, tomorrow. And that is a problem, an absolute problem. Because what happens is you borrow more money because you honestly have a positive view that it's going to manifest itself in more profits. And then that doesn't happen. And then all of a sudden you've got a debt you can't deal with. So I always, always, always suggest to people the organic route is by far the best. The problem with the organic route is it takes time. It normally makes you a better businessman, I believe, because you're smarter. You're smarter with your money. Now, if you get your money and you want to go off and buy a Ferrari and you're inefficient, <laughs> well, that's your business. But I would be thinking you'd be trying to put it away so you could buy the facility you're working from, which is also always a very wise thing. Uh, the first investment you should always try and do, in my mind, is own the property to which you're working from. Uh, and there's a whole raft of reasons why I think that, not the least of which the number of people I've spoken to over the years who have been in business for a decade or two have said, I could have paid this place off two or three times by now. Um, I'd be uh, I'd be a really wealthy man. So I think there are things, I think it's about compromise. You have to accept, you have to compromise. And in the beginning, you have to be willing to reinvest into the business. If you're not willing to do that and you want to take all the profits out, the business won't grow, probably won't grow, and you'll be in a position where you um, were when you started. So the first 10 years, I'm going to make up a number. I don't know if that's accurate, but for the first 10 years of your working life in a business, you've got to be willing to say, um, I'm, w- I'm willing to pour everything I've got out of this back into it. And that will come back in, in folds of 10 at the end of it. I'm sure you mentioned one time too that you said you, a couple of times you've given a, a reasonable amount of money to a, a small entrepreneur and they usually find a way to waste it or at least spend it on something that wasn't that important, but they think is kind of important. Not necessarily an extravagant thing like a toy, but like, you know, printing a gazillion business cards. Or Was that true? I think that's, I'm sure you said that at one stage. Look, I don't know what I've said it, but I would have. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes that does happen. But again, that's because they don't know and they don't know what priorities are. One of the things also that happens, and we'll go back to my earlier comment because it's quite important, if you grow organically, it's your money. So if it's your money, you tend to think of it differently. Now, if somebody comes along as a startup and they get given a number, a sum, $100,000, um, no matter what they sign to say that that money is coming back to the person who's originally, and no matter what interest they're paying, they'll act in a different way than if they were to grow the business organically. That's just a fact of life. Uh, what I normally do is I put uh, fairly stringent if I do help startups, I normally nowadays put a very stringent uh, repayment schedule on it and I make sure that whether they like it or not, I'm in the background until I feel that they're in a position to be up and running. And I, I do that to protect them as well as my own investment. Most people don't get it right the first time. Um, I think it depends on the character of the person too. You need to be, if, if you're completely greedy, um, and that is, by the way, as evil a sin as it is as being too generous. Businesses fail because people are too greedy, uh, as in they won't reinvest in the business, as an example. That sort of greed is as crippling as anything. You need to be generous with your business. If you're generous with your business financially, in other words, putting back into it, you'll have a successful business. If you take it for yourself, it'll end up what it's going to be. Um, and if you just feel you have to keep, things will go bad one day, so I've got to hold all this money back. I'm not going to invest in the business. I'm going to hold it back. That'll also end in tears for you. Do you think there's an element of, like, people's psychology at work there, like somebody who's hoarding and, like, I'm worried about that? It's completely that. It's completely that. People's psychological state 
in business, in my mind, is a grossly underestimated element of success or failure, grossly, for a whole raft of reasons. And one of them is that I've seen incredibly greedy people ruin exceptionally good businesses or potentially good businesses. Um, I've also seen people who are technically brilliant, uh, commercially astute, but unable to take pressure, unable to take stress, or unable to deal with people. They'd come in the morning, they'd, offer, they'd lock the office door, they'd sit there and do what they had to do while the business was left to its own devices. So your emotional state is incredibly important and your observational skills are incredibly important. You need to be able to assess the people around you when they're having good days, bad days. You need to assess the marketplace at a regular, all of those skills while you're under fire. Mind you, this is why you're having clients screaming at you. This is why <laughs> machinery is breaking down. This is why, you know, somebody's walked in your office and your key personnel is going to resign, right? It, this is all happening at one time. You have to have courage under fire and be focused on the task, and that is ultimately the business itself. And, again, anyone that focuses on themselves, the business fails. If they focus on the business and they really – I actually always believe I was just a person working in the business. That's how I viewed it. and. At the end of it, I looked back and I thought, well, that's probably not a bad way to view it. Rather than think of yourself as I'm the boss and this is a situation, I had a task, a series of tasks. I tried to do them the best I could. Um, and otherwise, I'm quite sure it would have failed or could have failed if either myself or my business partner had been that way and we weren't. I'm just trying to think of Felix. I know throughout the book, he, he threads this idea and goes, look, I know you want to make money, but it's not going to bring you the things that you think it will. And you're going to have to work like a dog and put up with all this stuff to get Correct. there. Um, now that you've left your business, um, I know, let me put this another way. The guy that owns Agora, I've mentioned he's, uh, so this is the company that owns Fatal. He says, look, I'm not going to sell my business. I'm not going to go from something that I understand completely to generate an exit to then go, uh, and be forced to invest in things that I don't understand. Once you left your business and you're sort of put this spread of things before you, you can go property or yep. put it in with a fund manager or the share market, did the skills you learn in business help you or hinder you maybe because the, the financial markets have their own little rules, which are kind of separate to real life rules, if you like. In How have you found that transition? Well, I think... I'm going to track this back to when I was a wee boy and I'll take it back to my mum always, I felt, had common sense and I think she instilled that in me. I think common sense made me a reasonably good businessman, believe it or not, and I think it's made me a reasonably good investor. So I think um, that common sense has spanned all my upbringing, my business life and now my investing life. Um, I don't think it's that diff different. And in fact, the skills I learned in business, I think, helped me in my day-to-day -day life quite considerably um, and, and my investing life as well. I think that, uh, that look, obviously, it's a different technical skill. So it's a bit like um, saying I played tennis and now I play football, right? But you're still fit. You're still active and you're still, your mind is still capable. You have to learn different things. But the principles are identical. The principles of common sense in your youth, common sense in business and common sense in investing to me has carried throughout my whole life. And I think that, um, yes, I don't think it's particularly hard at all. Um, it teaches you how to read people. It teaches you how to read contracts. It teaches you what to watch for. Um, and it's really not that. The transition's not that difficult. There's a significant difference with financial, from the financial aspect, because Investing, you'll never make the money investing that you probably would in a really good, profitable business. That's just a simple fact of life. You know, you have to settle for margins of 6 or 7 or 8%, where in some businesses you're settling for margins considerably greater than that. So, Yeah, so what you're talking about, the margin that your business had as a yes, correct. As a operation correct. relative to investing and getting, you know, 5% Agreed, agreed, yeah. that, agreed. You're talking that. about a fraction of what you were making previously. And that's why I think if you're going to give up your working life, you need to be very aware of that and you need to be accepting of the fact that you're jumping from whatever you're jumping to, A, you're not earning, B, you're not earning and making that margin, and B, where you go to um, is going to be giving you a return of somewhere between 5 and 10%. 
depending on the period of time. And also understand that in periods throughout that, it might be less than 5%. It could be actually going backwards. So as a good friend of mine says, you've got to have your lap of honour done. So you've got to decide you're going to sell your business or get out of it. You've got to make sufficient funds. And you've got to, when you decide you sell it, when you decide you're finished and you want out, you've got to have made enough money not to count on what you make when you sell a business. So that's very important because you may or may not realise that. Now, if you do, you're getting icing on top of the cake. If you don't, you're already finished. But when you finish, you need to be able to understand the way I live my life, I could live it that way, running at 5% of what I've got left. Now, if that's $5,000 a year, good luck to you. If it's half a million dollars a year, good luck to you. If it's $5 million a year, good luck. But you need to understand that before you make that transition. Throughout the book, as we just mentioned before, Felix sort of says, like, he has this line at the end. I don't know if you got to it. He's like, um, oh, by the way, if, once you've, you've achieved your goal, he's assuming that you've, you've, you've done well through your business life. He's like, what do you think you'll find? Independence of a kind, um, the freedom to do whatever you want. And then he goes, well, don't make me laugh. You know, it's just not that easy because <laughs> once you've built your wealth, you've, then you've got to manage it and, oh. and uh, all that you always talking to me about all your paperwork and stuff. Yes. Do you think you're any happier now than you were 30 years ago or no. how has life changed for you? Uh, the answer is no. Um, I, I don't think it makes you happy at all. I think that is one of life's great misnomers. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm not happy, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily any happier than what I was when I was younger. What it gives you is options and it gives you is freedom. That's true. This is a real first world problem. If you make enough money, it also becomes a burden that will chain to you to the end of your life because when you make a sum of money, you have to work it or it has to be worked and things happen. Shares have to be sold. Bonds have to be properties. You know, Tenants aren't in properties. There's all sorts of things that, that put you into a position where you're going to carry this ball and chain to the day you die. I always believe you should make sufficient money to have a happy life and do the things you want to do. Anything above that... Now, there's going to be a whole heap of people turning off right now and saying that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But, and it's a funny thing. If you don't get there, you don't understand it. You have to be there to feel it, um, where you think you look back and you think, well, that was fantastic. And the challenge was great. I have no trouble with my life and what I've done within it. I think it's been fantastic and it's given me things that I probably shouldn't have and normally wouldn't have ever experienced. But I think aim to have enough. Enough is enough. Um, and too much is a burden, and sometimes you die chasing it as well. And people do um, situations change in your life, your health changes in your life. Um, you really want to be able to, one of the goals you need to be wanting to have to do is that when you get to a certain age, as young as possible, you should need to retire. And when I say retire, retire and be able to enjoy what you've got. Um, it's a huge trap for people who continue to work even though they shouldn't be, because they're never going to spend the money they've made, but they continue to do it. So there's no that, logic there. That's so funny you say that, actually. Uh, Vern, who runs our sort of wealth uh, service, the people in your phase of life, if you like, uh, the more retired. Uh, that's cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> experience. No, but some yeah. of this, I, I sent him a thing because the feedback from people was, if you can retire at 60, do not keep working until 70 because you've yeah. got to enjoy it while you're good to go and get around and your expenses actually get lower. Correct. They, they were saying, I'm not. That, they, that is true. That is hundred percent true. As you get to 70, you're less inclined to do things. You stay at right. home, whatever. Yeah. So do it, do it now kind of thing. But having said that, you got to get there first. So for anyone listening, just to sum up what you've said, imagine they're relatively young in their twenties, thirties, maybe even a still fresh face 40. Um, yeah. <laughs> How do you, if they do, are interested in the idea of having their own business, what, what are your final thoughts on how to go about it? Well, th there's a couple of questions there. I'll just roll back to the, to the, the front of it. As I said, the, the, you need to start, you, you, need to have the, you need to be old enough to have the skills to be able to do it. That's the first thing. You need to also be very aware that you need to be getting out so you've still got time in the game. Now, so if you start when you're 25 and you aim to get out when you're 50, that's a good thing because there's life and then there's what I'll refer to as usable life. Now, your usable life is probably between 20 and 70 because 
after 70, you're restricted quite significantly in the things you can do. Some of the things I love doing, I can no longer do already, and I'm not quite 60 yet. So the importance is that you time that run considerably or closely. The other thing is you need to understand that don't let greed get the better of you and get out while you've still got runs on the board, but have sufficient money to be able to lead a good life. What will happen is you get caught up, you'll be like the mouse running around in the wheel, and then all of a sudden you wake up one day, and this is exactly how it happens in your 65, and you think, okay, now I'm going to get out. By the way, it takes you two or three years to plan exit from a decent business anyway. And the next thing you know, you're two or three years away from knocking on the doctor's door because there's something unwell with you. So get in early. Now, the catch is we'll go back to the beginning, have the skills ready to be able to do it and enthusiasm and be willing to commit. Understand that you're going to get out without being too great, greedy and hanging in too long and be willing to then enjoy your life thereafter. Um, that's what I would suggest is the best long-term game plan from start to finish. Now, very people, very few people say that. And I, when I read the book, one of the things I found a little bit offensive was there's this undertow where there's this constant belief by Felix that the only success in life is making money. So everyone else is unsuccessful. Now, that is unadulterated rubbish. People have successful lives who have no money. There's people who have successful lives who have immense amounts of respect, who have great lives and are content in themselves. So I think he's absolutely 100% wrong. Um, and I suspect if I'd met him when I read that book, like many people I've met like that, I suspect he's probably, and I hope I don't get sued for saying this, he's probably been a very greedy man who thought that that was the be-all and end-all. That's my reading it between the lines of that book, whereas I don't necessarily agree with that. I think pick a business if you want to do a business. If you want to make money and you have a good life, the businesses are challenging, but they're rewarding, more so than working for a salary. There's no doubt about it. I'd encourage people to go and start a business. Do your due diligence. Make sure that there's a market there for whatever you're intending to sell. Be honest with yourself about how you are emotionally capable of doing this, physically able to do it, and if you're able to, do it. Do you think the idea of a side hustle is legitimate or do you think you have to be all in to get a really good business going? Yeah, or you, you can start with a side hustle? I think you should always start with a side hustle. I don't think you should commit totally if you can avoid it. In all instances, you should. And again, it goes back to my belief about organic growth. I think you should test the market. And if you see there's a market there, then you can go. Now, not all businesses and not all people are capable of doing that. Lots of people are only capable of doing a singular thing, whereas you need to be able to have skills where you'll be able to balance more than one ball in the air. And that is a skill in itself. But I'd always advise people to say, if they've got an opportunity to test the market, to do it that way. Do you think... So Often you hear about people who you know, were a photographer and they decided to open a restaurant and then they find out the restaurant industry is not what they thought it was. Do yeah. you think people should stick close to what they know or it is legitimate to make a leap? Um, or it's know, a case-by-case case situation? No, no. I think um, if we're talking about running a business, there's no difference between running a restaurant and my analogy is making ping pong balls, which you've heard me use many times before, I'm sure. It, a business is a business is a business. The same principles are identical across them. Um, you, you probably have to, well, you have to have some enjoyment from what you're doing. Otherwise, you'll never put up with it for a long period of time. So you need to be enjoying what you're doing. Interestingly enough, the running the business can be where the enjoyment is. In other words, whether you're making ping pong balls, running a restaurant or driving or owning a mechanics workshop, some people enjoy the running of the business more than the physical doing of what they're doing. And it doesn't matter whether they're making ping pong balls or, or car windscreens or whatever they happen to be doing. And there is some truth in that. There is an element where you, you break yourself off in two parts. You still need to have your fingers in the pie and understand what's happening with the business and be an expert in it, I might add. But you certainly can and have to have the other part of your brain working on the physical business, which is cash flow, human relations issues, all those other things that you need to do as a business person. And one final thing, if, if you're in a business, you're going for it, do they quickly find someone like you as a mentor? Do you think that's advisable to have someone at your back from the get-go? If you can. Uh I, I, I'm not a big fan of mentors, right? And I, I think 
but it depends on the character of the individual, I would say. And the reason, there's two reasons I'm not a big fan. I have, there's only two people in the world I would trust to mentor me. Um, one of them is myself, and one of them is a very good business, ex-business partner of mine who I was in business with. Other than that, I've met many, many who profess to be it, who make some of the dumbest calls I've ever seen in my life. So I think you can be led astray. I go back to my earlier conversation where common sense is so critically important to this. Most decisions in business revolve around common sense. And it could be as simple as, do we spend money we don't have? No, common sense tells you that's probably not a smart thing to do. There's a raft of things that go through your mind that you need to apply. And I think that's why normally good, successful businessmen, as a general rule, are quite pragmatic people who have a fair bit of common sense. That's my understanding. You very rarely find erratic people running successful businesses. You need to um, have that ability to apply it. The other thing is, it's very easy as a mentor to say to somebody, you need to do this and you need to do that. But at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own life. You're a grown adult. Um, once your mum taught you how to tie your shoelaces, um, you were on your own, right? So you've made decisions along your life um, to do that. Now, I know a lot of people make a lot of money out of mentoring. And as I said, for the most part, I've met a lot of them and I've met some in in that would be perceived to be experts at this particular thing, but I, I'm not convinced. Do, do you need somebody that you can run issues off? Well, if that's the definition of a mentor, I'd say, yes, that's helpful to have somebody that you could come to. And I, whenever people come to me, I never answer the questions for them. I give them both arguments. I say, well, if, if you're saying to me this, the solution is either going to be all, the consequence is this, but the reaction or the positivity is this. So what do you think you want to do? Now, the moment you go to the mentor and the mentor says, no, you've got to do this because I think that's what you need to do, then it's time to look for someone else. I'm probably um, rare in that I don't necessarily believe true mentoring. If you want to run ideas off people, that's one thing. But if you're actually wanting that person to drive your business remotely, that's something different. Well, I was just saying it's really the hidden behind that is the outsourcing of the decision to somebody else, really, isn't it? What oh, well, that's that's and, and at the end of the day, if you're gonna fail, you need to fail on your own steam. You need to fail because you've made a series of errors. Um, the last thing you want is to fail and look back at it and think, well, that was because Fred told me to turn left there, what? right there, and left there. It's funny we can because the share market has taught me the same thing. Like if I'm going to invest, I want to do want to know that I've done the homework on the idea and I'm not taking somebody else's. Because then you go, oh, why did I buy that? <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Look, you might you might want advice on how to find that information out, and you might want to say to say, look, all of that is important. It depends. I guess it depends on your definition of mentoring. But if mentoring is the extreme case where the individual is basically directing your company, I'm totally against it. If, if somebody comes to me and asks me a question about a particular element of their business, as I said, I never answer it by saying, this is what I would do. I say, well, if you do that, you might find this happens or you might find that happens. So are you willing to allow that to happen, to sacrifice against this? Um, it's interesting. I always find, I'd say 99.99% of cases, when somebody brings the issue to me and I talk to them about it, once I've put the arguments, both arguments together for them, because that's constructing the arguments where people struggle, they pick the right one. Now, I don't know whether it's because I'm spinning it, I'm subliminally spinning it, which I may or may not be doing, but I've tried to stop myself from doing that. But more often than not, when you break down the problem and you put it into two baskets, 99.999% of the time people will pick the right basket. I could sit there and say to them, okay, this is the consequence or this is the action, da, da, da. What, what would you like to do? And it's very rare that people do that. But they have the, the difficulty in breaking the problem down into the risk versus the return. And, and contracting or business is all about risk to a large extent. It's about managing risk and identifying risk. Well, let's sum it up there. Sum it up there. It's interesting. I just realised my old uh, colleague, uh, Phil Anderson, used to have wrote a book and he said, look, the best way to build long-term wealth uh, is to have a, a good business and acquire good real estate over time. 
and uh, and that's essentially what you're what you're saying if you can make it work right. so uh all right, we can leave it there. Thanks, mate. That's been great. And um, there you come. thank you for reading three quarters of Felix Dennis. <laughs> yes, of, of old Felix's book. He's quite verbose, as I said. <laughs>